opportunity to thank Korea and, and Sundar for my invitation and to do that for me so far. And especially I would like to mention, you know, after I had accepted and everything, and about two weeks before I was to come, I got an email from Korea and saying that Sundara suggested that I could bring my wife and uh, her head would be paid. Although I didn't use it, I must thank you for that offer. And it was really kind of you to suggest such thing would be so grateful. So, thanks and uh, I think let us have the last lecture now. It will be by Sundar uh, uh, student. I have seen him long, long ago, not too long ago, five, six weeks ago, you know, in the research of the Sastra and going to see him and all that. And uh, so, great Prakash Gupta, and he is at the university in Noida, private university, and he will be speaking on uh, Green Free Center of the Planner Ajit. So, and uh, I really feel proud that uh, I was your student and you agreed to guide me. Those five years were really wonderful. I learned a lot from you and uh, thank you so much about that. Okay, well, let's get into mathematics now. <laughs> ah, fine. So first of all, let me show you uh, five years or let's say four, yeah, five or six years of writing mathematics can make you so handicapped. Think, so make a guess. Yeah? Even with this? Okay, I'll try to be uh, concentrated here. Yeah, that's what I want you to try. <laughs> well, guesses? Okay, okay, let's uh, not make you try too hard. So, uh, I just thought of uh, writing something in a calligraphic style. And what came to my mind was math cal, and this is what it was supposed to be. <laughs> I just could not think of any other font, so you know, that was the thing that came directly to mind. Okay, so many, many happy returns of the day. And uh, this photo didn't appear till now during this meeting, right? I found it from the web somehow. <laughs> when was this? I don't know. Your eyesight is at, at Delhi, I think. <laughs> anyway, so happy birthday, boss, and that's how fondly we call you, boss. <laughs> yeah, so about the talk uh, that I want to give upon, it's basically going to be uh, somewhat detailed version of uh, what Shami, you know, told you that I'll be talking about. I, I won't go into the details again, thorough details again. A quick glance of how things, you know, helped us to get to that conjecture that he was talking about. And uh, so this is the plan. So the main target is to understand the jones workers conjecture relating Drinfin Center and affine representations. And uh, the, so that will be the first part to understand how this uh, conjecture came into picture and uh, a little bit about what its relevance is. And then I'll talk about what were the steps involved uh, in proving this conjecture. So of course I'll I'll try to be I'll try to start from basics. So the first thing we'll do will be to understand what a Drinfeld center of a tensor category means, what, what was Walker's conjecture, and uh, what was Jones's formulation of that. And in this part, I'll okay. We'll, Some we already discussed this a bit. I'll also talk about it in short. That we verified this first uh, for the <coughs> irreducible depth of factors, and then. Uh, we went towards the full generality. Okay. Yeah, so what a tensor category is, it's, so just think about the category of Hilbert spaces, what all nice structures in it possesses, and that is all we want to list here. So a tensor, al also called monoidal category, is just a sextuple where you have this data. Uh, so C is just a category, and then you have a tensor notation as you take tensor products of Hilbert spaces where that tensor should be a bifunctor. And well, you, you understand, you can take tensor products of bounded linear operators in a nice way. Okay? And uh, for all objects x, y, z, you need a, an associativity constraint, which we have for vector spaces as well as Hilbert spaces. It's the same thing. 
and they have to satisfy a pentagon axiom, which means you know you take four objects and you start with one uh, configuration of the brackets and you just move along one way and some other way you reach the same place okay, in a nice way. And then you have a unit object like the complex numbers for Hilbert spaces and you tensor it with anything else, you get the same thing in a nice, um, well, natural way. So say. And those are those naturality conditions what are known as left and right unit constraints. Okay? And they have to satisfy a nice triangular axiom. And so the immediate examples that we are aware of are vector spaces. I'll just be sticking to uh, sticking with the field of complex numbers. That's why this bold C appears there. And Hilbert spaces, algebras over complex numbers, and representations of some group. Okay? So these are some nice categories that we know. And they all have this uh, so-called tensor category structure. And then, so apart from this, the typical tensor categories that we work with have some further uh, rich structures. And let us list a few of them. So one ideal thing that we would like to have is called C linearity, which means that each you know, the homomorphism, the space of morphisms between any two objects is a complex vector space. And uh, the morphisms, uh, the composition of morphisms, the tensors, they, they have to be bilinear. Examples are, of course, categories of vector spaces, Hilbert spaces, and the representation categories of groups. Okay. Then we ideally want the next structure called star category. So here, of course, your category to begin with has to be C-linear, and there is this contravariant functor, which of, well, well, it just takes the object to itself, uh, and it, it has something nice on the morphism spaces. So if you compose uh, two morphisms and take the star of that, it should just reverse the order. Okay, and uh, there is an involution property as well. I forgot to mention that. So F star star should be F. Okay, and what uh, the next nice thing that we usually we see is called braiding. So a tensor category is called braided if there is a family of natural isomorphisms. Uh, so for every uh, pair of object x and y, you if you just flip the order, you should have a nice isomorphism among them. Well, of course, the immediate examples are these uh, vector spaces over complex numbers, Hilbert spaces, uh, representations over of group G. Whereas, if you look at a half algebra, then this representation category turns out to be braided if uh, the co-multiplication is co-commutative, which is not always true. Okay, well, don't bother about that. I think Izumi also talked about this in the morning. Yeah, and uh, some uh, categories are even better. You know, they have this braiding with the extra property that if you um, repeat it from y tensor x to x tensor y and look at the composition, you get identity. Okay, those are called symmetric tensor categories, like, of course, vector spaces over C, Hilbert spaces, as well as rib G. Okay, that is something much nicer, but we don't expect that to happen every time. Still, so. Then comes the notion of Dinfeld center of a tensor category. So your starting data is slightly modified. You just uh, you don't want any tensor category, but you want what are called strict tensor categories, which basically just means that you can ignore the bracketings. So A becomes identity, and uh, the left and right constants also you can just, so like C tensor any Hilbert space is just H, you know, just identify it that way. So yeah, ignoring that those few conditions, what the kind of tensor category that we have are called strict tensor categories, and for such tensor categories, we define what is called the Dinfeld center. So here, the, the basic idea is that uh, this category that you start with need not be braided, and we want to obtain a new uh, tensor category which has a braiding. Okay, and this is how it is done. So the objects in this category are pairs of this kind, where the first guy is, th th these are again objects of the original category, and you have a family of uh, natural isomorphisms where for every pair of objects y and x, you have this kind of isomorphism, okay? what you would like to expect in a braided category. Fine. And they have to satisfy that, okay, it's like you shuffle first or you shuffle in an intermediate way, you reach the same place. Okay. That is the condition that is required there. And of course, the morphisms will also have to do something with the family of uh, these C's that you have. So an 
a typical morphism between these two objects in the Greenfield center will consist of morphisms from the original category, but commuting with the uh, this constraints, the C constraints that we talked about. Okay. And uh, yeah, the unit is the I usual unit of the original tensor category along with the identity morphisms at each level. And the tensor is again given by, oops, it's a, uh, this guy is the tensor and the uh, morphisms, well, the commutative constraints that we started with for X tensor Y. Okay. And uh, this family that you already have, X, Y, forms uh, braiding for this new tensor category. Fine. So, uh, this was about basic definitions at this level. Now, how does uh, well, a little bit about the relevance of Drinfeld center in some known contexts. Okay. So, here is, uh, yeah. so this slide talks about the Drinfeld center of the representation category of a group. So, we, we just work with finite groups for the time being and we consider its group algebra this admits a canonical co-multiplication, just sending g to g tensor g. This has a nice property of what Izumi talked about in the morning called co-commutativity. Okay. Because of that, well not just because of that, because of this co-multiplication, the representation category possesses a C linear tensor category structure, where you just uh, hit each component by g. And that was actually you know, hitting it by delta of g. This, I just uh, kept this because this carries forward to half algebra half algebras. Okay, so, with this uh, and then one talks about the quantum double. Uh, you also saw this in Sami's talk in the morning as well as Izumi's talk. So, we look at the opposite of the group algebra and its dual and tensor it with the group algebra. There is a nice half algebra structure on this uh, tensor product and well, I have just, well, it is fancy somehow that even a uh, yeah, I have been observing this that you know, most of the big guys, whenever they give a talk, they still emphasize the importance of some physics in operator algebras. Although <laughs> operator algebra itself is so rich and there are so many things to do. So, let us quote some physicists. <laughs> they have to talk about these objects. So, this physicists say that you know, the, this object, quantum double of a group, arises naturally in the conformal field theory and that it is important to understand the understand the representation theory of this quantum doubles. Well, let us take that for granted. <laughs> okay. So, uh, how does one understand the representation uh, theory of this quantum doubles? And this is what uh, you heard from Sami as well today, that if you look at the Greenfield center of the uh, representation category of the group, it is precisely the uh, well, uh, equivalence in the tensor uh, notation to the representation category of the quantum double. Okay, and then of course this statement also you saw today. So it's another repetition for you. If you have any finite dimensional half algebra H, then its representation category inherits a C linear tensor structure via this. So you saw that you had this naturally there, and just the co-multiplication there gives you something here. Yeah, and the fact carries forward to the context of uh, finite dimensional half algebras as well. We, uh, okay, so this is important for us because I, I'll tell you that how we used this to prove the first version of Jones-Walker conjecture. And uh, well, one could, I, I think, uh, since I'm not an expert of category theory, and this talk has a flavor of category theory as well as a little bit of uh, representation theory. I just thought I should Google a bit and see what people have done in Greenfield, about Greenfield Center. So, I, I think this would, you know, motivate you that uh, these objects are really important. So, Google tells us that mathematicians have spent a good amount of time on the Greenfield Centers of various important tensor categories. And I don't know much about other uh, tensor categories, so let us not ponder about that. Yeah, so, these objects are really important. And then, let us come towards, uh, in the context of our world, well, TQ of T's are not our world really, but this uh, conjecture of Walker had some relevance in the world of planar algebras. Okay. So, let us see what he had to say. Uh, of course, it does not make much sense to us because we do not know TQ of T's much. So, what he says is that if lambda is any C linear category and lambda to the r or lambda to the a are their uh, say rectangular respectively annular versions 
of the corresponding locally defined picture or relation categories, then the Drinfeld center of the rectangular version is precisely the representation category of the annular version. Now, well, in words, the Drinfeld center or the quantum double of the representation category of the rectangular picture category is isomorphic to the representation category of the corresponding annual category. It does not make se much sense to us, <laughs> frankly speaking. But uh, let us, uh, well, you already saw some relevance of this in Shami's talk. He, he just highlighted that, okay, we have some similarities of statements happening in, in the world of planar algebras. So I'll just give you a small background how that appeared. Yeah, so relevance in the context of planar algebras. So we again start with uh, an outer action of a finite group G on a 2 1 factor. So, this is the third time you are hearing this today outer action. It's basically that for every G, the automorphism that you get is not inner okay, on the 2 1 factor. So, that is called an outer action. And then we have these fixed points of factor, as you saw in some talk, that you just looked at, look at those elements in M which are fixed by everything in G. This turns out to be true and factor, and as you saw in his talk, that Jones associated a planar algebra to sub, such subfactors. Let us call that to be P here, and then we consider this Ockneanus tensor category of n n bi modules generated by this standard uh, module over M. Okay, and this is known to be equivalent to uh, representations of the group G. Izumi talked about this in the morning today. And uh, we saw above that you know, the representation category of G is precisely the representation category of the quantum double. Okay? Now, let us see how does uh, this representations of planar algebras come into the picture now. Yeah, so, Jones had introduced this notion of, of so, affine representations came a little later. The first notion of representations of planar algebras was what, were called, what was called annular representations. So, he defined uh, annual representations of planar algebras and studied them for some specific planar algebras. And then, as Shami pointed out, well, he gave you the final statement, but the way it, um, yeah, so the way we went about it was through this. Uh, so, from his thesis work, it could be deduced that, you know, the Hilbert, I'm just writing Hilbert annular for what are called locally finite. So, Hilbert annular P modules were additively equivalent to the representation of quantum double modulo some ideal. Okay? So, d g mod j denotes a non-trivial quotient of the quantum double. And then, you know, they realized that this quotient appeared because of some pictorial reasons. And that's what, what Swami was talking about, that when you have an affine tangle, the affine isotopy does not allow you to rotate the internal or the outernal disk by 360 degrees. Whereas, in the annular um, category, you were allowed to do that. So, that was the difference. And that forced to come up with new definition of representations. Okay? So, that's when this new thing came up. That Jones then in introduced a fine representations of planar algebras. And for what Sami told you today is that for the fixed points of factor, n, m, g, and m, it could be concluded that well, the category of affine P modules is indeed additively equivalent to the category of the quantum double of the group. Well, and what did this do for us uh, in the language of subfactors? It proved for us that the center of the category of n n bi modules generated by that uh, standard bi module, say L2M, is additively uh, equivalent to the category of all Hilbert affine P modules, okay, where P is the al planar algebra of this subfactor. Yeah? So, this was the first instance of uh, a similarity between um, yeah, Walker's conjecture in the TQFT world and something similar in our planar algebra's world. And then Jones reformulated this uh, to this. So, you also saw this statement in Shami's talk. So, we just let us just recall it. So, what he has to say is that if n is a subfactor of m and it has finite depth uh, and p is the associated subfactor planar algebra, then the category of finite dimensional Hilbert affine representations of p is equivalent to the Drinfeld center of the Ockneanus category of n n bi modules generated by this. Yeah? So, as Shami had pointed out, at this point we could just talk about additive equivalence because we didn't have the notion of uh, tensor product. Of Next subfactor to be considered was the fixed point subfactor 
coming from the outer axon of a finite dimensional C star Hoff algebra, what we call a Cox algebra on a 2 1 factor m. Okay. And this is the result that he talked about that if P is the Jones's planar algebra associated to such a subfactor, then using the fact uh, that what I mentioned before, we were again able to obtain a partial verification of the Jones Walker conjecture that the category of NN by modules is indeed additively equivalent to the category of Hilbert uh, P modules. Yeah, so, here, okay. now here I should mention that you know the idea behind this was that yeah, so this category, you know, the category of NN by modules, we could see, okay, so or I should say the center of this, we could see that there was a natural correspondence between representations of the affine morphisms at plus one one level. Right? So we constructed the regular representation of that star algebra, and then we somehow found an equivalence between Hilbert affine P modules. Uh, by looking at that regular representation, but because it contains all the other representations of uh, AP plus one plus one. Okay. Yeah. So the lack of tensor structure on F I N P modules, you know, well, it kept troubling not just us but others also for some time. However, uh, quite recently, you know, well, uh, some could not give you a complete picture of what exactly it is, but some nice pictorial uh, criterion called commutativity constraints and a nice pictorial formulation of traces that he gave you today on the affine endomorphism spaces helped us to formalize a feasible tensor structure, not on the whole of uh, Hilbert affine P modules, but on a full subcategory of that. Well, this is in the context where P is a planar algebra coming from any um, subfactor, not necessarily having finite depth. Okay, that's why we have to restrict ourselves to a smaller subcategory there. Yeah, so let us now see how do we formulate the Jones's theorem uh, in a greater generality. So now for us, P will be a subfactor planar algebra, possibly of infinite depth, uh, associated to an extremal subfactor N in M. Yeah, well, this is a technical term, so let us just keep it the way it is. And uh, we had this notation. You saw this already in some talk that HAPM is like Hilbert affine P modules, so the category of Hilbert affine P modules where the morphisms between objects V and W are natural transformations with some nice boundedness property. Okay? And with the tensor that, well, we could not see today, and the counter gradient that somebody defined in his talk. So this category turns out to be a C linear tensor star category with unit. You already saw that the planar algebra is itself a Hilbert affine P module. And the way we defined, well, he suggested that the way we wanted this tensor structure to be was that this would act as unit, and we indeed have that. Yeah. And uh, then this new notion actually, uh, well, I, I'll tell you a reason why we had to come across this definition. So this is some kind of uh, non-degeneracy condition that we demand on the Hilbert affine P module. So this is how I, I was just talking about it in the previous slide that we want to <coughs> restrict our category to a nicer subcategory. And this is one, let us call it say a non-degeneracy non condition that we want to have on the um, Hilbert affine P module. So a Hilbert affine P module, V is said to have finite P support if there exists a K greater than or equal to zero such that, well, uh, all the uh, vector spaces that you have are of this kind. Now here, we, don't, we didn't talk about this kind of thing, eh? AP 0 plus K plus L. Okay, so this is some pictorial requirement. Okay, just take it that way. So, and it can be seen that if P is of finite depth, then all Hilbert affine P modules have finite P support. Okay, it's... Uh, Yes, I think for infinite depth, we have diagonal planar algebra should be the case. Yeah. And this is the full subcategory that I am talking about. The full subcategory of HAPM, Hilbert affine P modules, consisting of Hilbert affine P modules which are locally finite and have finite P support. Fine? So, D for a finite depth subcategory, finite depth subfactor is precisely the Hilbert affine P modules with. Uh, which are locally finite. Locally finite basically means that each uh, vector space 
that this V epsilon k is finite dimensional. Okay, it's also called finite dimensional. Actually, one coined the term finite dimensional, and we somehow like to call it locally finite. And the aim now is to prove that. So, if this p is coming from, yeah. So, if you look at the center of the bimodule category of this subfactor, sub then we want to show that it's a nice tensor braided equivalence uh, with respect to this uh, subcategory in the Hilbert affine p modules. Okay, so this is what we believe is um, the right analog of uh, Wacker's conjecture in the context of planar algebras in full generality, okay. in not bothering about finite depth of the subfactor. Okay, so now I'll try to give you a sketch of this. I have almost 15 minutes. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So uh, the first thing that we want to do is that see the category of NN bimodules is not a strict category, right? You have associativity constraints there, whereas to talk about Drinfeld center, it is better to avoid them. Well, it's not that one cannot define the Drinfeld center for a non-strict non tensor category, but it's quite easy to handle strict categories. So we look for an equivalent category in terms of pictures, okay? And it's quite easy to see that, and this is the prescription for that. So before that, uh, we will need this pictorial elements. So here you have f and g from different uh, vector spaces in the planar algebra P. So k and k, k and l might be different. Now we cannot in general multiply them, but let us say that they mutually agree that we'll don donate a little less than our actual strength uh, or a little more also to form something new. Fine. So this is some kind of generalized multiplication that we have stacking them. Uh, with some deficiency, you can say that. Fine. So we'll see that how is it useful to us. Fine. So instead of the uh, Okniyanus NN bimodule category, we work with an equivalent strict uh, category C, which is pictorial in nature. And what is that? So the objects will are basically projections in the even spaces in our uh, planar algebra. So they are precisely bimodules, NN bimodules generated by that. Uh, to one factor L to M, yeah. So, yeah, and then the morphisms will be just elements in P plus K, P plus K plus R, where either you hit by your projection from the right, so you stack it from the right, or you stack it on the left, you still uh, land up with the same guy. Basically, intertwiners. Yeah. So this is how you see those conditions in terms of pictures. This is the most natural way of looking at that category of NN bimodules in terms of pictures. And composition of morphisms is basically just uh, yeah, composing two intertwiners kind of things. Okay. And uh, identity morphism is just the identity, which means just that projection. And the star structure on P induces a star structure on C, where, uh, yeah, so where for a projection the star is basically 180 degree rotation that is the catch so to get the contra gradient you have to rotate it by 180 degree okay and then the st uh, tensor structure on this is basically stacking your so this is the relative com commutant stacking your projections side by side in the picture format so, so if you take your so this is a kind of bimodule p and a bimodule q and R and S, you just do it. So the tensor product is just stacking them together, which is the relative tensor product. And the tensor product of morphisms is again stacking them together. Okay. And unit object is, of course, the box, the empty box, basically. If you just multiply with uh, tensor it with anything else, it does not have any effect. And the way we define the things, it's clearly seen that the associativity and the unit constraints are basically trivial. Just get what you ha already have. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, well, let us just reformulate the Drinfeld center of this new pictorial category. And uh, the objects are pairs, projections, and some commutativity morphisms. Well, a family of morphisms satisfying the properties that you already saw in the first uh, few slides. Now, what is important is that since we are working with a star category, 
all these uh, natural isomorphisms will be demanded to be unitaries. Okay. That is an important requirement in this setting. Now, a morphism as you already saw there is an element, uh, it is a morphism in the original category which is compatible with C and D. Remember the conditions that we already had there. And then uh, what is important here is that to construct this kind of C's, it is not always necessary to look at C, um, well look at the family, look at the whole family. It is enough to look at the family C 1 plus 2 M. Just look at those projections, put them here and there and whatever you have, you know, that is enough to build the whole, um, yeah, this commutativity constant C. Okay? Uh, but the only thing is that they have to satisfy some, uh, some pictorial conditions called grouping relations. This is really important in the whole, um, yeah, the whole process that we had to go through. Okay. Now the tensor structure on the Drinfeld center of this pictorial category. Well, so if you have two objects P, C and Q, D in the center and well, where P and Q are projections, then as I told you in the previous slide, we need a sequence of that natural morphism. So this is the guy that we are talking about, E 1 plus 2 M is defined in a pictorial way, this way. And uh, well, it is, uh, yeah, we verify that they satisfy the grouping relations and therefore we obtain a morphism in the uh, Dreenfeld center category. Okay? So this is how the tensor product looks like in this way. And this gives a bifunctor on the Dreenfeld center of this pictorial category. Yeah, the identity object is again just the box, empty box and the identity is at each level. The associativity and unit constants are trivial, so this is strict. Okay. Yeah, now uh, we want to construct the functor, so from ZC now, because we basically wanted to have a equivalence between the Dreenfeld center of the category of NN by modules to that subcategory what we denoted by D, but we have just shifted our focus to this pictorial category. So we would like to construct a functor from the center of this pictorial category C to D. Right? Now here is one remark that is quite useful in doing this. So this is basically to reduce our work and uh, well, it is a general understanding that if you have a shaded planar algebra where you, where it is a double sequence of vector spaces, it is enough just to consider the positive part of that. Okay? Likewise even for affine modules, it is enough to consider just the positive parts. So we would like to just have an equivalence from the center of this, the previous pictorial category to you know, what we call plus affine P modules, which means it has just this restricted collection of vector spaces. Okay? Yeah, so how do we do that? So for any object in the center of that category, well, of course, P was some projection, we construct a plus P affine module in this way. So the vector spaces are, you define the V minus 0 to be this subspace you know, generated by images of this kind. Okay, so we'll just let it be. Okay. And the P plus L is again, you look at P plus KL and stack uh, from the bottom by P. So this is a subspace of P plus K plus L. Okay. So the basic idea is that you know uh, we had to understand that all the affine P modules are in some sense embedded in the planar algebra P itself. It, what was involved in you know identifying that properly, and this uh, we came up with this after we had done it for the irreducible depth truth of factors. There it was quite obvious to get, not obvious, but it was. The picture, yeah, the formulation was nice in pictorial form, and we just carried it forward in the finite depth case. Okay. Fine. So this is the way we define the vector spaces, and uh, well, I think you can ignore this. How the axon appears on that side, and uh, yeah, so with this axon and the spaces that we already had on the previous slide, this V forms a locally finite plus a fine P module. I should have noted this there. And uh, we need uh, Hilbert affine P modules, so we need an in inner product of them. And that we define by the picture traces that we have on P plus K plus L's. And 
with that on oops yeah here also because the way it appears it's a subspace of p plus k plus one and the above axon preserves star and this makes v into a locally finite hilbert uh, plus a fine p module and we denote this uh, the guy v that we constructed above by v p c so that is uh, going to be our functor oh okay i did not say that yeah and now we would like to see that you know under this association so pc going to vpc we still uh, land in the locally finite domain so if we have two objects in the center of this category we define re as you saw before to be this tensor and w to be the tensor so this is the tensor that was that shami was talking about then with some yeah, some cute application of commutativity constants which helped us in defining the tensor product and uh, uh, and the say uh, inner products on these two um, new affine modules we establish also that this tensor product is also locally finite okay. and by our mere construction uh, the this spaces this hilbert affine plus p modules turn out to be turn out to have finite p support the non degeneracy that i was talking about okay so in fact it was after this construction that we realized the necessity of this finite con finiteness condition okay so this was the yeah uh, still we are not completely through but what we get is that this association actually extends to a contravariant fully faithful c linear monoidal star functor from the category the center of this pictorial category to the subcategory d now what remains is to see that it is essentially surjective and that was not very obvious so we had to work a little for that as well and uh, that's just 2 minutes so i think i'll better just say that okay with it involved hardcore um, pictorial analysis planar algebra techniques using the commutativity constraints in fact the sphericality as well for preserving of star structures and uh, the pictorial trace that uh, shami talked about today to finally prove that this map is essentially surjective might be i can just tell you how to get hold of the projection that you have uh, yes so okay the proof of the previous thing i can just ignore yeah essential surjectivity so let us see how we ca catch that projection first so if w is any hilbert affine p module having finite p support so it is from this finite p support condition that we catch that projection okay so there is a there is some l in uh, some natural numbers such that w plus m is the span uh, the non degeneracy condition that we have for everything and one can view w plus l as a finite dimensional left p plus 2 l module by restricting the axon of this to the subalgebra this now uh, pictorially it's very um, nicely seen that our vector spaces of the planar algebras sit inside the affine endomorphism spaces so through that on every affine p module we also have an axon of the planar algebra and in particular of the constituent vector space uh, c star algebras at each level now what is fact is that if we consider this uh, pictorial subspace of p plus k plus l this is also a p plus 2l module so you are just taking p plus k plus l, l a projection p in p plus 2k hit it from the bottom in that Uh, fancy multiplication that we so okay so this turns out to be a left p plus 2l module where the inner product is again coming from the trace triangle and the axon is just by hitting from the top yeah. now what is interesting is that for any finite dimensional hilbert space v uh, with an axon of the unital star algebra p plus 2l there exists a k greater than or equal to l and a projection at that level such that v is isometrically isomorphic as p plus 2l module to v plus l so this pictorial subspace of p plus k plus l has this nice property so every module is basically captured inside the planar algebra so that was the main link between the two things and the upshot then is that we have a projection at some higher level and uh, such that the w that you started with the w plus l there is isomorphic to v plus lp and this we extend to the whole of w to v and it satisfies all the nice properties that one would expect okay well of course it has some work to be done 
I'll just skip that. And eventually, with all the hard work done, we conclude that. Uh, okay, so another that another thing is that after P, we also wanted a C, and that also involved some work. And we could prove that this pair is indeed uh, an object in the center of the pictorial category. Okay, so this is the theorem that we finally came up. So this is a general formulation of Jones Markov conjecture. So because the planar algebra that we consider here is for any subfactor, it could be infinite depth, and nice is basically locally finite, and uh, finite P support Hilbert affine P modules, and so we have this equivalence. It's a very nice equivalence of preserving the tensor as well as braiding. Okay, and uh, well, the remark would be that this proves jones walker conjecture in the affirmative if P has finite depth, because this nice things are precisely finite dimensional Hilbert affine P modules. So I think that's all that I have to say. Yeah. Thank you for staying and listening. Any questions? What happens if CG1 and CG2 are isomorphic? Need not be isomorphic. That is there, but you would like to understand what I mean. Is it that you want to understand whether the representation categories are isomorphic or not? No, I mean, what is your question? Are you asking me whether? C G one and C G two can be isomorphic without G one and G two being isomorphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think if the group algebras are isomorphic, at least the representation categories are isomorphic. Yes, the quaternion yeah. and uh, the hedral group, they have the same CG. No, that's fine. No, what I'm saying is that if the group algebras are isomorphic, the representation categories are isomorphic. So I mean, at that level, it does not matter. Yeah. So the other way is not obvious. Any more questions? Yeah. So you have this C consists of projections, right? In the even, even, even. Yes, yes. So if you take one projection and the same equivalent projection and the higher, right. are they isomorphic as objects in the C? Yeah, yeah. We have that. Uh, that comes from Dietmar's paper, in fact, yeah. that their ranges are isomorphic as n and by modules. Yeah. So you just stack some Jones's projections at the corresponding you know, next even level. And that gives the next projection up to equivalence. Yeah. Any more questions? You, uh, you mentioned something like essential subjective. Why do you say essential subjective? Well, we don't have, uh, like for every object on the other side, we don't have a pre object here. But what we guarantee is that there is an object uh, in the image which is equivalent to something you already have there. And that is enough for equivalence of categories. Any more questions? I think if there are no more questions, we have one more. So let me thank all the speakers for their talks and the audience for its patience. Thank you. <laughs>